But I'm a true libertarian as well, right? If you want to do that stuff or you want to eat bad or whatever, you can do that. I have no I have no problem with what you do and you should have no problem with what I do. I think one of the problems we run into is you're so worried about telling me what I should do and I'm so worried about telling you what you should do. Welcome to Farm Alarm, my name is Tracy. Today we're at the Baker Creek Spring Planting Festival 2019. Let's go inside and see what's going on. Yeah, it was. Where are you from? Uh, Raymore, Missouri. How far is that from here? Three hours and 15 minutes. 260 miles. How far away are you from here? Uh, it's about a four hour drive. Yeah, that's about what it is for us too. Yeah, um, it's actually distance wise, it's not super long, but the hills are just crazy and so it's so hilly down here. How far did you travel to get here? Four hours. Do you need to know specific miles? Yeah, exactly. Could you actually tell me your coordinates where you live? No. I think it was over somewhere around 800 miles in 14 hours, so nice little hike out here. What brings you to Baker Creek? Um, I absolutely adore this company. I've been uh, shopping from Baker Creek for I think like nine years now and uh, so I definitely love having a part with anything that they're doing. Why Baker Creek Seeds? Why not? Why? Because they're the best option as far as I'm concerned. You know, to find something that is this uh, invested in bringing the best that the world has to offer from all around the world that's natural, you know, unmodified, pure food and put it in the hands of the average gardener, I think it's phenomenal. I started saving seeds um, as a teenager. I grew up in a gardening family. My parents and grandparents and all my aunts and uncles gardened and uh, I just guess seed saving was the natural next step when I noticed uh, varieties disappearing out of seed catalogs. And, you know, the banana melons and the different beautiful, uh, different beautiful vegetables that were in the seed catalogs in the 80s started disappearing and they'd actually been disappearing long before that. But it's, my goal is to try to bring them back and reconnect their stories and connect them back to the cultures and people that brought them here or developed them and uh, keep the traditions and foods alive and uh, connect people to seed saving and food people and gardeners and foods, get them all back in the hands of gardeners and the general public again and get the farmers growing these different heirlooms again and telling the stories of not only the fruits but also the people. They're claimed to be non-GMO. I don't think, I don't know if they necessarily claim them to be organic, but um, I know I can trust them. Oh gosh, because they're heirlooms, non-GMO, you know what you're getting. Like it's real food and we just like supporting the movement of not giving money to the establishment. <laughs> and it's nice that we can actually drive down here, attend these festivals, meet more people, get more knowledge, uh, speak to Jerry on any kind of particular seeds that we're looking for. It really is an important work of preserving seeds, preserving a heritage, uh, preserving things that would go extinct if it was for only up to the industrial conventional food system. I feel like it's a local company. I mean, it's a physical company we can see when we go to a store, we're buying seeds from, we don't know where they're from. And so it's beautiful to see a family organization like this that supports its community and supports small homesteaders. And I think it's great. Mmm, that tastes exactly how you'd expect it to. Delicious. Cable TV or satellite? YouTube. <laughs> that's a great answer. I actually didn't think you'd say that one. There's been some talk in the news about um, anything that's GMO has to have a label on it that says it's GMO. What are your thoughts on that? I, I would think that labeling stuff as genetically modified so that you know what you're eating is good. GMO labeling being mandatory. What do you think about that? Overall, I think it's even more important that people get hands-on in growing their food and knowing where their food comes from. Yes, it's important, I think, for food to be labeled GMO, but it's sad that we actually are at this point where it has to be labeled that way. Uh, but uh, I think it's a good idea, but overall, I want to encourage everybody to just really get hands-on in knowing where your food comes. If you're not growing it yourself, get to know the farmers in your area and support them and know the story behind where your food comes from. It's a good thing because 
people that are using GMOs are going to have to make people aware, and that's going to turn people off from buying it. We have a right to kind of know what we're buying. That only makes sense to me. I think it's good. Um, it gets people more aware and more conscious of what type of foods, what's, uh, well, what's in the foods that they're going to be trying to consume. Why is there so much fight back on it? Okay, so recently in the news they're talking about GMO labeling and products will be you know, forced to put GMO labels on, on food products. What's your opinion on that? Uh, I think they should. I think that, that we as consumers should be aware of what we're putting into our bodies and we should uh, support companies that already do that. I would love to see some more clear and distinct labeling. I think people would benefit a lot from having a lot more understanding about what it is that's going on. So many people are supporting something that they think they don't believe in, but then they support it with their dollar because the labeling is just not clear. I don't think it'll ever happen. I mean, just be transparent you know, what you're selling. I think it's a great idea. There's information on every package of food that we buy, but for some reason, when it comes to the GMOs, there's a lot of fight back on it. Yeah, if somebody wants to eat it, that's all good. I mean, it's a free market. We could do what we want, but why not let the people know? Yeah, that's that's the thing, right? Yeah. There are, labels are on everything that we consume. Why not have that on a label? That's should like tell you something. Then. I mean, you know, I'm not trying to be the conspiracy guy, but there's something going on there, like Monsanto and Bayer, who don't want people to know because they're scared food production will drop because people won't want to buy it. So, but yeah, I'm all. But I'm a true libertarian as well, right? If you want to do that stuff or you want to eat bad or whatever you can do that I have no I have no problem what you do and you should have no problem with what I do I think one of the problems we run into is you're so worried about telling me what I should do and I'm so worried about telling you what you should do I'm a true libertarian everyone does their thing and then let the chips fall where they may John Deere or international Ooh, international hands down there is no green on my farm um, that's loud how far did you travel to get here I think he's camera shy. Why don't we need a twirl? Yeah, yeah. Should we twirl? Yeah. And then we will be breaking out a new way to take up your tomato. MU or KU? KU? Are you kidding me? Don't s speak of that trash. Arm day or leg day? What's more important? Ooh, ooh. Well, my farm days are a combination of leg days, so they're both all in one. So uh, they're together, so I can't separate them. <laughs> when you're pulling chicken tractors or you're you're uh, squatting down, harvesting lettuce and greens. I'm getting my legs in at the same time of farm day, so there's there's no separating it. <laughs> KU or MU? It's KU, sorry. <laughs> Just because I married into it. Like, I, I grew up in Missouri. My whole family's Missouri fans. They all went to Missouri. But I married a KU fan, so I have to be KU, sorry. <laughs> what is your favorite pepper? My favorite pepper, absolutely the ghost. Uh, I don't have any on me because they're in my camera bag, but the ghost pepper. Three times hotter than a habanero. It was the real kind of super hot pepper that stepped out on the seed and made a lot of the hotheads kind of come out of the woodwork. We've seen a lot of steps up from there with the Carolina Reaper and the Trinidad Scorpion Butch Tea and the Pepper X, but the ghost pepper was the one that did it for me. My favorite hot pepper for sure. Cardinals or Royals? Oh, that's easy. Royals. Right here. At least it's Missouri. <laughs> Cardinals or Royals? Oh my gosh. Royals. Come on. Of course. <laughs> just, because he's, just because he's standing there. No, because I don't like sports and Royals is the only one that I actually enjoy watching. So why do you homestead? Who influenced you to homestead and maybe to YouTube? Uh, we started on this journey watching Justin Rhodes, uh, Blake Kirby, Art and Bree, Dan at the Grassfed Homestead. Uh, we, we saw Farm Alarm before we started our channel, I'll tell you that. Um, and we thought we can do better than that. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, but no, seriously, we, we saw channels that were at home with their families and they were growing their own food. They were raising animals. Uh, we thought it was a, a more fun way of living a life, a more um, fulfilling way of living their life. And so we always thought if we could do that, even if it was on a small scale, maybe part time, not even just a full time thing, um, it would be amazing. And it's just been everything we imagined it would be just uh, the YouTube things a grind and it's hard work to succeed on YouTube but at the same time to be home with our family 
and to watch our kids grow up and to know what they're putting in their bodies, that's what makes it all worth it. I'd say my grandpa inspired me to homestead for him. Yeah. And our health. I think it just became apparent that uh, we were going to have to take care of our health and what we put into our bodies. And well, we didn't know this whole community even existed yeah. through YouTube and this community of faith and just all that goes with it. And so the more we've done it, the more we've just really found our group of people yeah. that we fit in with. As far as homesteading, who influenced you to homestead and to YouTube? So it kind of a our, there's two different answers to that so it's always been our dream I would say my as far as homesteading has always been my great-grandmother um, she she would just tell me about how she grew up and kind of things of the past and I always kind of just crave that and and Jesse kind of shared that dream and then as far as YouTube it was just something that um, I watch a lot of uh, demolition ranch and off the ranch and once that started I used to, I don't have as much time as I, I do now. But anyways, um, once, once I saw them go into the, the family side of that and some of those channels transitioning to that, I'm like, hey, we have a big family. There's, people might find that interesting. And uh, we just started and it kind of steamrolled into what it is now, which is just a lot of fun. And I would have to say my husband, although I didn't realize that's what it was called, he was talking about he wanted to be more self-sustaining, know where our food came from that kind of thing and grow sustainably in permaculture and uh, when somebody talked about homesteading I didn't know what that was I thought about that Tom Cruise movie where they hitch up wagons and they like race for their 40 <laughs> acres and so he said no that's that's what this is this movement is called homesteading where people are returning to their roots returning to some of the old ways so he's the one who got me into homesteading and then when we decided to make the move from the city to the farm and I did not grow up on a farm or anything like that and I thought it would be an interesting um, that YouTube would be an interesting way to document my journey of transitioning from city life to farm life and so that's where uh, the name Not A Farm Girl comes from. I would say God. We had to find a way to drop the cost of living that we could fulfill what he was calling us to do as a house, uh, as a household. So what we decided to do is home educate our children. Mom was already at home. We tried to find a way to pull me out of the workforce where I could work from home. We figured the only way to do that is if we live easily, sustainably, debt-free, provide a lot of our own needs. And, um, you know, I could leave my family for a couple hours, go give the government a portion of that, take whatever's left and go buy something that's very questionable that somebody else supplies me with. Or in that same amount of hours, I could grab a couple of my kids, head out to the garden, and we could work the soil, we could reap what we sow, we could plant that, and not only just invest that time together and building that relationship together and being there as a role model in the life of my children, but to inspire them to be connected to the real world around them. Um, the homestead thing was just like a lifelong dream. Since I was a kid, I was like the animal person in town. Everybody brought like the baby birds that fell out of the nest to me. And I, that was that was my entire life. I always loved that. Then I fell in love with the garden and the homestead just sort of came out of that. Now YouTube, uh, that, that took me a little while. I actually tried a few times to get started in it and then just let it fall to the wayside and then I don't know I really got a glimpse of this community and how wonderful it was and I thought I really want to do this I want to take it seriously I'm gonna to stick to it I just want to do the stuff I want to do the things I want to grow my own food and I kind of grew up that way you know my mom canned and we grew all of our own stuff and I, I loved it then I still love it now I think for a lot of it was Joel Salatin and I'm sure a lot of people say that but for me, it was actually more of a nutritional standpoint, so there's a lot of like nutritional people that inspired me to homestead. First one, when we were stationed in North Carolina, it was I was fo following uh, an American homestead um, for the longest time. I really liked their channel. And then when I started, when we were looking more into farming, um, it was more in, in homesteading. It was more, it was off-grid, it was uh, Doug and Stacy from off-grid with Doug and Stacy. And then it kind of exploded from there, um, seeing you guys and then Jer Jesse and Jeremiah from Arrow Ridge, uh, Jake and Becky from White House on a Hill. Everybody's got their own little piece of the pie to add to the farm that I can use to help us start out and be productive and efficient. One of the first persons, first people that inspired me was Jules DeVase. Uh, he's now passed. Uh, he operated Urban Homestead in Pasadena, California. And I was amazed on how much food he could grow off of a tenth of an acre. 
and right now his children continue to run and operate the farm and homestead, but they are in the middle of the city and they're growing food for them as well as food to sell, and it's amazing the amount of food that they can grow. It was because we were sick and tired of being sick and tired. We wanted to have more control over our food. I don't want to read labels, so guess what? I grow it myself. I don't need a label. I know what's in it. Um, and why do I do YouTube? Our passion is to help teach people. And so that's our main number one goal is um, make you guys laugh a little bit, hopefully, and also teach you something while you pop through our channel.